shake, rattle and troll. It's time for the award-winning shake, rattle and troll. Kids, the A show for the serious fishermen as well as the novice looking for tips from the pros. Shake, Rattle, and Troll brought to you by Bill Loot Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram. I-17 and Camelback Road since 1927. Yeah, we got the power, we got the speed, we're running wide open on a midsummer breeze. Fresh water, soft water, watch out, boys. Fast Daddy Don's gonna make some noise. Me and the boys gonna shake, rattle, and your host, saltwater fisherman, the man that fears no fish, Bass Daddy and Tournament Pro, Don McDowell. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm Don McDowell. Welcome to Shake, Rattle, and Troll today. We are going fishing. We got Derek Franks in the house. We, uh, man, you know, this is like a Freudian slip, and I'm not going to do it. Striper, snatcher. I got That's it. Right. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> we averted it again. Yeah, boy. JK's in the house. Uh, man, he's got the newspaper rolled out all over the... Yeah. You're either serving fish or you're going to nail somebody today. Well, I'm going to take some issue. There's two things. Number one, we're going to take a little issue with uh, one of the editorial staff for the Republic, Linda Valdez. Nice. She's a bright woman, but unfortunately what she winds up doing is is she makes comments on something that she doesn't know enough about, which is the Mexican gray wolf. Isn't that a genetic defect? I think it is for all of the staff. No, they're not specialists. And then the second one is is that 25 years after the destruction of the timber industry in Arizona, the Republic put out a survey to their panel of five is, do you agree with environmentalists who oppose forest thinning plans? All five said no. I don't. Nice. I do not agree with environmentalists. You cannot protect just the spot at all and have the destruction of all of our. Property. We need to send them uh, half a dozen uh, Dunkin' Donuts. I, you know, one. I'm thinking every one <laughs> yeah. of those five needs to be have a big thank you. And I'm, yeah, Maple Bar. If we could find them, I want to do it. Okay. Well, today, J.K., what Derek is going to do is school you on the art of the rattle trap. Oh, is a school like a fish school? Is this oh, a fish school? I like a that. school of Ooh, fish? Yeah. I'm yeah. going to be schooled? Yes, yeah. indeed. Talk to me, Goose. Talk to me. Well, you know, since the last time I've been on the show, uh, the fishing has really started to pick up. The The water has dropped all the way to probably 55% elevation. You're talking at the... Uh, at Pleasant. Lake Pleasant. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I had to back up. Yeah. That's what it does. Yeah. So 100 we, vertical feet a year. Yeah, that might make it tough to, to stay on them. To find them. Yeah. But basically, uh, we've been blessed with a, a monsoon-rich summer right now. And the the water temp's still in the mid-80s, but the the night lows are low. I mean, it's 72 degrees uh, the next three nights uh, with a little bit of rain in the forecast. But what I've been seeing is the <clears throat> the bigger fish have broken out of the deep water and they're chasing uh, they're chasing shad on top of the water that are just eating plankton, and it's it's pretty easy to spot them in the evenings. Um, and they're hammering this rattle trap. Well, yeah. <clears throat> this is the time of the year where the rattle trap really, really it, it's a good bait all, all year round. But this is But time. going into the fall, this time of the year, the rattle trap is a mainstay. It's a good reaction bait. And, you know, most fishermen like to get real complicated and throw $30 airbrush crankbaits at fish like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's nothing wrong with an no, a there's hand not. painted, <laughs> no. airbrushed, wood-made lure. Definitely not. I just like to keep it simple and throw the old blue-collar crankbait at them, you know? And nice. Yeah, and it works. I mean, it's, it's a great reaction. Okay, uh, what, what, what color is your favorite? I like to throw a one-ounce chrome. and Blue back or black back? Blue. Yeah, it doesn't even matter, really. Yeah, it does. I mean, they'll, they'll it, it either don't either way. Don't tell Don that it's a color co- doesn't it, matter. It, color does matter. Yeah. It's, I've learned that. Well, the black and blue um, or the uh, black back, either one of those. But, uh, you know, you'll agree with this. Fishing, 90% of it's a, a confidence factor. Definitely. So, I'm always confident I catch nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I am confident I will not catch a fish. You know, they're the blue back... Uh, I should have brought it today. I've got one that is so chewed up. Serious. It, it's in retirement. Yeah. I mean, it's done its job. I've got a few in the rattle trap uh, assisted living on the top of my refrigerator. That's, nice. where I, that's where I pull all of them out. My girlfriend has no idea. There's a, 
The last all star that I fished was Barry Lewis. Barry had something to do with uh, Denny Brower back at uh, Table Rock Lake. So it was a uh, December December tournament. I caught forty one fish that day. Wow! And I weighed a whopping six point three six pounds. Oh, oh wow. my! Oh, <laughs> but, uh, all of which uh, that tells us that they were all twelve inches. And yeah, just the, yeah, they were all uh, un, you know dinks. But you know what? That that dead gum rattle trap just bam, 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 bam. And it was weird. If you didn't have a little spot of orange on your rattle trap, when you you, you wouldn't catch a fish. Isn't that interesting? It's bizarre. Hmm. So the moral of this story is. Carry a bag of uh, assorted color waterproof sharpies in your boat. That there we go, sharpies. I I swear I think that you're right. You're on to something. Well, rattle, rattle traps got some new stuff out. That uh, number two sixty. Have you tried that one? Possibly. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that. But anyway, go back yeah. on to fishing. Well, yeah, you know the <clears throat> most people like to get too complicated with what they're throwing at these striver. You know, throwing real light baits, but uh, I like to condone throwing a one ounce rattle trap because I can throw it a long way. Yeah, and, you know those liquor. those stripe are moving uh, as fast as a trolling motor will go. Um, so you want to be able to throw something out there uh, as far as you can. How many ball bearings on your uh, reel? You use a bait caster? Or I just use a, a Shimano Corrado. You know, just okay, that's good enough. Something, and then my clients are throwing a, a little quantum spinning setup. You know, and. And just something real basic, you know, and I'm always preaching to keep it as basic as I can. I'm not trying to throw uh, anything uh, top water. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to do that. But what I like about the rattle trap is you can fish it in a different water column than oh, the yeah. top water bait because those yeah. stripes are going to go up and down. Uh, what I've noticed is they're, they're chasing the shad into the wind, uh, and a lot of people don't don't really have the visual cue of what they look like when they're doing that. But... What they'll do is they'll chase the bait into the wind at a certain depth, and then they'll go down. And so they're they're constantly changing their depth. So with a rattle trap, you know, you, you don't have to adjust much. Well, that's a interesting. You brought that up. There's a kind of a universal fisherman's code. If you know that, keep the wind in your face. Definitely. Throw wind to the wind. Yeah. And uh, that that's caused more than one. Oh yeah. <laughs> one argument on the bow of the boat. And a backlash, maybe. <clears throat> the well, backlash, I can understand. Yeah. Well, the 260s, they, uh, you know, they call it the blue shiner, and it's got a little blue on the back and uh, just a just a hint of purple. Ah, it's like all that. about the color. Yeah, you know, this is almost like a sensual discussion with Don. It is. Just a hint of purple. <laughs> well, the cool thing about a rattle trap now is they, they make custom patterns, so you could you can get a shake, rattle, and troll color, you know. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I need to talk to him about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Chris uh, Carlson has uh, hand painted some uh, DD twenty twos with the color purple, and I honestly believe. Yeah, you know, there's times of the year that they're going to whack whatever you throw out there. You know, out of hunger, out of territorial aggression. You know, whatever the case may be. But when, when the bite's tough, you got to have everything right. You, you know, do. You know, you, you just have to. And the thing about the lake, you know, the, the lakes, <clears throat> Lake Pleasant especially, is there's so many invariables that come up. You know, you may show up with one tactic, and you better have a good plan B because, you know, the wind changes every 30 minutes, I feel like, right now. And that place is, you know, that's my home lake. But i got to tell you, it, it, you know, I've heard this from all of our western pros and, the you know, the pros from back east. And, you know, they come out here to fish this, and... and uh, what you know about bass fishing at Lake Pleasant, do the exact opposite. Yeah. It is the absolute toughest bass lake on the, on the lower 48. No doubt. And fortunately, I've been seeing a lot of largemouth mixing with the striper, you know. So if if you're fishing for largemouth bass and you're not exactly sure what to do, just follow the bait. You know, that's... Are pretty, you catching pretty, any? Yeah. Yeah, we've been catching them off, off uh, reaction baits like the rattle trap that go uh, zipping through there the the largemouth will you know break out of their structure and and start to run with a striper for a little while uh, i've seen them in the lower water column most yeah. usually mm. yeah when the striper get the bait all the way up against the shallow shelves you can you can see the largemouth in there with them just um, having just, just having their way yeah well, here's the uh check that out on the computer screen there 
that 260. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's got I all like the right. That. Yeah, it all all the right stuff. Yeah, that looks nice. If you had to have a go to, JK. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I could do that. That's the go to yeah. bait. I understand that now. For those of who are listening and are visually impaired, it's pretty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's got just it's got all the right stuff. It's got the blue, a little hint of purple, and just a, a splash, just a splash of red on the bottom. So some of the guys go in, you know, and uh, they like to have a red line on it or a bloody red lip and that kind of thing. Bloody nose, if you will. See, that's so much better than saying a hint of purple and just a <clears> dash <throat> of red. <laughs> Well, just a dash is good. Uh, you can liken this to uh, grabbing a, a bait uh, on the on the tuna boat. You don't want one with a a, a, a red nose. Yeah, you mentioned that. No red on it at all. It has yeah. to be a really fresh looking good bait. Fresh, 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 fresh hot bait. Yeah, absolutely. Now, on, on your rattle trap, do you uh, change the uh, back hook off? Put on the bleeding hooks. And, you know, especially the uh, Daiichi. Usually, I throw them right out of the box. But one thing I like, and I, I like to get some, but they're hard to find, is those spin traps that have a, a little spinnerbait <laughs> blade on the back. Because uh, okay. that's just one less hook to hang in my shirt, my shirt, or my carpet. Because that's been the thing. That's that's the fad. I'm trending. You're, you're, okay. Well, that's not a bad thing. But you know, at the beginning of your dissertation, you hit it back to the basics. Definitely. Absolutely. All right, having said that, uh, when we come back, we're going to try to get a hold of Captain Bell. I think he's driving the boat today. Oh, he's out there. Yeah, maybe. Hey, I'm Don McDowell with... Derek Franks. And... Special K. Yes, you are. All right, we're back. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a delay on uh, Captain Bill. The uh, Malahini's at the bait receiver getting scoops of bait. Fresh bait. Fresh bait. Fresh bait. No mm. red noses. Yeah, you know, those are excellent bait with a little mustard sauce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Last Good time stuff. I went to a bait barge, the seals would try to uh, break into your, your bartering there. Those That's when you take your uh, <clears throat> wrist rocket with the uh, extra long surgical rubber bands on it. And, ah. a, and a bag of marbles. Okay. And marbles and leave an impression. <laughs> That's uh, ecologically uh, correct. It doesn't really hurt them, but they quit it. Yeah. <laughs> we I heard, did not harm the environment with those marbles at the bottom of the floor. Oh, no. No. Yeah. E- eventually. Okay, so what what's the, the big key right now of uh, locating these fish? Well, um what I like to do is because, you know, the wind is blowing this time of year, and it's blowing bait and plankton all over the place. So um, I'm going to go and fish those windblown uh, banks. Um, so I've got a few spots on the top of my head. But uh, we've been getting a south southeast wind, so I've been fishing uh, between Scorpion Bay and the Pipeline Cove. Uh, there's a lot of good features underwater uh, that have them congregating on steep drop-offs. Um, and then I'll spoon fish there with a with a big one and a half ounce spoon for a little bit, and you know catch some good nineteen twenty uh, inch fish doing that. And then when they start breaking, you can see on your sonar them coming up in the water column. You know nice. uh, later in the day you'll see them getting higher and higher, and then before you know it they're going to start just zipping all up and down the bank. But they're not uh, they're not staying in one place very long, so uh, you're going to have to stay on your trolling motor to, to keep up with them. That I noticed when I was out with you. Is yeah. That, I mean, if they 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 just move. Yeah, fast. Very fast. And of course, if I were the shad and I'm being chased by a striper, I'm out of there. And then the boat just has to, you have to determine where they're jumping all of a sudden. You, it's like scanning the horizon. Where are they? Where exactly. are they? Where are they? And oh, in, that's where you need a crow's nest on the bass boat. I, yeah, for sure. Yarr. And into a faint wind, it, it makes it tough to makes it tough to see them. So you get yeah, yeah, it takes a little, a little eye to develop uh, yeah. what you're looking for. Have you been caught out there at all in any of these monsoons? I got caught in three in the last two weeks, and the first one was awful. Uh, I took a guy that hadn't been on a boat in probably ten years. Um, Perfect. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, and we get uh, yeah. This is a fun story to talk about on radio. But I go all the way to the back of Humbug Cove, and we're catching a few striper. And uh, there's six ladies in a rental pontoon boat, and uh, they're having problems with their kill switch. 
So I basically had to sacrifice 30 minutes of my sight fishing time to go help them out. There uh, was nothing attractive about these six ladies I couldn't either. even tell you what their profession was because I don't even think the radio would allow it. There would be too many covered ears. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I helped them out, and then it's sort of white capping way inside of Humboldt Creek. From white the, capping in From Humboldt? the south. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, we launched on the south part of the lake, and now we're in a way in the north end. So. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I cruise around the corner in the bass boat, and we caught it right in the face. It Damn. was awful, awful. Why didn't you just wait it out? It was almost dark, and I didn't, you know, based on the... The radar I saw it, you know, we just caught the first of it, and it was going to be there for a while. And it was bad news bears. So one client texted his wife, uh, saying, "You know, we're not going to make it. You know, we're like, we're not going to make it home." So he was freaking out. And the other guy was an experienced bass fisherman, and and he's, he's having he's fun. Yeah, he, he he was kind of laughing. And he was he was texting his wife what the vessel assist phone number was, <laughs> and, and she thought that we were just jack, pulling her leg, jacking with her. But no, we actually needed the number. And, no, uh, he, he's right there over at Scorpion Bay. Yeah. yeah. Well, fortunately enough, uh, we made it back, but, you know, the, the lesson I learned is if you're expecting really, really choppy conditions, don't put a fuel stabilizer before you fill up because all that got into the bottom of the tank, and when, you're, when the bow's vertical, you're not going to get a good mixture there. And so I'm cutting out the entire way, uh, trying to get back into this. Bounce. Yeah, and it was awful. I mean, I'm going 500 RPM in a 50 mile an hour wind. It was awful. Whoa. Awful. You need a bigger motor. I need a bilge pump sponsor after that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to stay away from pontoons that are in distress. I know. You know, I thought it was like a candid camera when I saw what was going on. <clears throat> really? You know, I was looking for the, for the, uh, for the show <laughs> that, that, that bust you, you know? Uh -huh. I thought I was going to get busted, but. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. And then uh, last Monday I got caught up in a bad one. But what I've learned is uh, this time of year you got to have a good fishing spot next to where you put in because it's not worth <laughs> it's not no, worth where, that. Where, where do you normally launch? I launch at Pleasant Harbor. Mm, there you uh, go. Yeah, and so if if I'm fishing Scorpion Bay, that's not that far. But uh, you know, if you're way up in the middle of nowhere and that stuff sets in on you, you're in trouble. You know. You can just sit there Part all day long, ride it out. It's not going to last forever. Yeah. I would. No, no you learn that after a while. But, you know, he's he's got a different situation. If you and I are out there and we don't make it home, no okay. cares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you got a client on board, that that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You know, the old and, clients and don't like it. It's interesting to see the demeanor of, of different folks. Um, I just uh, got off the boat with uh, Jimmy Dwight and... Uh, uh, going back before Jimmy got his um, 90 mile an hour bullet, let's say, he still has the uh, one of six center console Beesmeyers that were made back in the 60s. Big, heavy wood over glass boat, you know, bye bye. Got a 150 horse old carbureted Johnson on it, and he and Dan, and, and Dan, God love you, I'm not picking on you too much. <laughs> Dan passed away. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. But Dan, we're, we're, one of these big Chaboscos blew in from the south, hit Roosevelt. We're coming out of uh, Sally May, and Dan's screaming, We're going to die! <laughs> Jimmy's going, Sit down and shut up. Hold on. <laughs> no, we're going to die! Yeah, that's, that's... It was bad. We had seven, eight-footers out there snap the uh, the gears off in my uh, trolling motor, and it, it was a bad day. Yeah. And Dan didn't die then. No, later. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to comfort your client when they're uh, when they're getting pelted with about fifty pounds of water each time the bow hits a wave. You know? It's so, okay, we're gonna make it. Yeah, so <laughs> so now you're the now I'm the little country fried Doctor Phil out there trying to navigate <laughs> us back to the dock, and pet on the client because I'm I'm nervous too. But I was trying to act like I okay, knew what was and, going and, on. and you explain to him that your boat's foam filled and it's not gonna sink. I'm like it's completely normal to be. Uh, 90 degree vertical to the <laughs> yeah, to the water is, right now. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's, that's it. Just yeah. in between the chop. Yeah. By the way, sit up front, will you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a hard thing to do. Let me ask you this: uh, the rattle trap has a uh, what they call a slap stick. Have you tried those? I haven't. It, is that their version of the jerk bait? It, yeah, it is. I haven't tried it. Jerk, jerk, pause. Jerk, jerk, whack. They have some nice products that I have yet to try. 
um, I saw like a tungsten, a vibrating bait that's kind of you know a thin piece of metal. Um, you got a you battery can hook on it. A mile, you know, it's one of those long casting baits, uh, reacting vibrating bait that is a one piece. You're not talking about the uh, vibra trap. Yep. Okay. That's it. Hmm. And see, ones like that they don't have here. You know, you you don't get those. I guess maybe that's a. Is that uh, East Coast? I, I don't know. We are rattle trap deprived here in the valley. You know. Well, you know, I want to say one thing about the rattle trap. There, there are an awful lot of uh, lure clones out there, and I've had a discussion with uh, a number of uh, folks that work at uh, Cabela's. You know, I go in and I want a particular bait. In, in, in the last time I had this discussion with them, it was the Labiner Lures Rio Rico, and I wanted a holographic shad. He goes, "Well, we don't carry those." I go, "What?" He says, but we have these. I said, no, you don't get it. I have 25 bucks in my hand, and I want that bait by that name, and I want it next. Well, these work just as good. And I'm going, no, they don't. Yep. You know, you're not getting it. Okay. And Bass Pro Shops is the worst. Uh, they've taken, uh, they've got their whole Bass Pro Shop line of clone yeah. spinoff knockoffs, if you will. And it's interesting. You can take a bait that just looks, or, or a lure that looks like exactly like the one you like. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yep. It looks like that. But the, the sound, the rattle exactly. trap, it's the sound. Yeah. They, they resonate differently in the water. Um, they do. It, you know, and it, again, it's a confidence factor. Definitely. I have confidence in rattle traps, I have confidence in Labina lures. The Ricos, and yeah. I don't want to fish for anything else. No, I'm real old school like that too. You know, one bait's all you need almost this time of year. Anyway. Oscar Meyer, you've right. just been called old school, Don. Yeah, buddy. Okay, well, hey, that that's cool. You know what? I'm good with that. I agree. All righty, hey, we're gonna uh, thank some of our sponsors. Did you know that Bill Luke Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram sells tires? No. I did not know that. Premium tires for whatever you're riding or driving. I'm Don McDowell. Special K. Derek Franks. We'll be back. I don't look good naked anymore. The old lady wants to roll in the hay. We turn the lights down all the way. Because I don't look good naked anymore. Man, I, you know, we got to swear off those Dunkin' Donuts, man. I'm telling you. What's this wee stuff? Wee <laughs> stuff. Okay, yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're a mere shadow of yourself. <laughs> man. All righty, hey, we're going to we're gonna give a call out to the Malahiti, uh Sierra Romeo Tango 6. Uh, Malahiti, do you copy? Over. Uh, roger that, Blue Leader. Uh, right on, right on. We've got Rock and roll. Captain Bill. Sounds like you're in a wheelhouse, man. Uh, actually, no. I'm on my couch today. Uh, we thought you were on the water. Oh, uh, well. Uh, no, sir. Uh, no. I was on the water yesterday. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, yes, it was indeed. But it was kind of slow. You know what I mean? It was slow. We only wound up with, uh, I think, uh, 13 yellowfin tunas and uh, one Dorado for a day, 45 anglers. Weather's wow. up a little bit, you know, bouncing around. White cappy, kind of hard Ooh. to see kelps, things like that. But we did manage to see about three or four gigantic schools of uh, 100 to 125 pound bluefin to them. Uh oh. We hooked three, and uh, I think we had them hooked for about 22 seconds, okay? <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> to the yep. end of the line. Yeah, I'm tracking on that. Uh, it's kind of funny to sit there and watch, you know person get hooked up on 20 pound and you can't stop the fish and wow. you just see the line just I, i'm gonna say 22 seconds and it was gone bam snap you know we're, we're we're talking uh what 150 200 yards gone in a minute in, 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 in that short of a time it was kind of funny we pulled up and i saw our mark we spun a circle it didn't respond right away and then uh all of a sudden, you're looking out the, the uh, port side of the boat, see this Volkswagen jump out the water, like, what the heck is that? Nice. Oh, my God, these are the big ones. Oh, my gosh, they're rushing the boat. Oh, my, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> 
crazy. Kind of it was really funny, guys. Well, without giving anything away, uh, how far out were those uh, big bluefin? Uh, we're fishing. We found those at, I want to think it was 21 and 28. That's, the, that's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, I got it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm cracking on it. Yeah, you know, they, Mexico shut down bluefin again. It was good to go for about four days, and then we got a letter from SAC telling us that, uh, not that they were wrong, but we had to wait for the official word from the Mexican government, which, which is cool. You know, which is cool. We were allowed to fish it for two or three days, and, you know, the overnight boats did really, did really, really well on them, and, uh, and we got that letter, and then it shut down again. We what was, uh, Captain Bill, what was the reasoning for the uh, lifting of the uh, ban? That I don't know. That I don't know. I, I know why they they uh, enacted the ban, because they said that the quota for the year was met. Sure. Yeah, and, I get that. Yeah. I was like, well, how does that apply to, you know, the recreational angler? No, I can understand, you know, you're wrapping, you know, 505 tons of bluefin for, for commercial purposes. Yeah, okay. You know, Kelly, I told you, like, I told you guys last week that uh, California is trying to do the same thing. Talking about the biomass of bluefin tuna is being overfished. Well, I don't yeah. think so. You know, I don't believe that. Well, may, may, maybe not on the left coast, but over on the, uh, off the Atlantic seaboard, those big boys are kind of hurting. That doesn't surprise any of us. I mean, you know, they're legislative happy California. You have laws for everything. Well, there. we've got another band coming out on uh, mountain lions, in California. No, you. Well, they, there's another one. Banning what? You can't touch them. You can't hunt them. You can't shoot them. You can't trap them. You can't that's hate, been, hate that's them. been in existence forever. Well, they're doing something else to it. I wouldn't doubt it. No. Welcome to California. <laughs> well, it looked like overall, uh, you know, maybe the fishing, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, they didn't actually have a dock count for the uh, the day and a half boats yesterday for some reason. There wasn't any uh, half day report, but the uh, one day uh, dock totals, 202 anglers off of nine boats. 261 on the yellow fin, 159 on the yellow tail, 22 Dorado, no mention of blue fin, and a Benito. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it, it should have, it should have been slow for the whole fleet. I mean, just, just because of the weather itself. You know, I mean, it, it's not like it was, you know, really rolly or bumpy or anything, but it was very, very white cap. You know, it made, it makes it very, very hard bird schools and jilting fish and this that one thing that one when the ocean's like that what kind of wind were you experiencing oh i'm gonna say it's probably going 15 to 25 yeah you know you start to, you, you know it's going more than 15 knots when you start to see white caps yeah boy yeah yeah and the ocean looked like a washing machine yesterday it is well, okay, we will uh, wish you a good day. Uh, who's your pick for uh, NASCAR today? Mm. Uh, you know, I'm a still a Jimmy Johnson fan. Uh, that's a good bet, especially yeah, in Michigan. He's a California boy, too. <laughs> he yeah. grew up, as a matter of fact, he grew up right down the road from where I live. Well, and we've, man, got, we've got a running battle with... Uh, Big Mike out here. He's he's a died the wool Jeff Gordon fan, but nothing wrong yeah. with that. Well, you know he couldn't even beat Danica Patrick last week. Come on, really? <laughs> Two oh weeks ago, goodness. you weren't talking because he won. No. Wow. Hey, Not last real week. quick. Go ahead. Not to change the subject. Uh, Havelina Hutton, you, Arizona, when and where? Oh, well, I know where, but when? Uh, I, anytime I'll, December, January, February. Well, January and February at best. It's archery, and then it's draw on the muzzle loaders and the handguns, the ham hunts. 
Uh, uh-huh. There may be some over-the-counter archery tags. Maybe. Maybe. Let, let me look okay. into that Monday we'll, yeah, morning. Yeah, we can do that. I'll you. shoot you an email on that. Oh, that definitely work. Yeah, because they have uh, special provisions for uh, being able to harvest two of the little darlings. Particularly from anybody from California, too. We encourage that. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> okay. One other thing. Uh, if you guys are planning on coming out to go to go fishing with us, I would strongly suggest you guys call and make that reservation. Cause it looks like right now we're booked uh, solid every weekend until about the first or second, almost second week of September here, guys. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, are, are you hiring uh, any uh, temporary uh, deck hands? Deck hands. No. Come on. Come on, I can cook. No. <laughs> no. Come on, I, I, I cooked on the Blue Horizon for 16 months, uh, crewed with Norm Kawagana on the Shogun. Really? Yeah, a number of other boats over there, so... Well, we'll have to talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, get, you get a spatula and a mop. <laughs> <laughs> and he uses both at the same time. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, you got to oh, love it. Oh, my. All right, Captain Bill. God love you, man. Tell the guys on the Mount Haley we had said hey, and, uh, man, just tight lines. Will do. All hey, right. You guys have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you next week. You got it. Uh, Captain Bill made a good suggestion, 619-222-1144, or book online, hmlanding.com. What can I say? Bluefin tuna that are as big as a Volkswagen. Oh yeah, yeah, that hundred hundred fifty pound class. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. And and the, that must be frustrating to just watch your line rip off and know there is nothing. No, I mean, I would put the brakes out. No, no, you can't. I've never had uh, that happen. Oh man, you had a couple like that, didn't you? Uh, in, in, in my lifetime, yeah, I, I've had a number of those, and uh, I think the biggest one uh, we had, we got into some uh, three to four hundred pound class uh, down at Laos Rocks years ago on the uh, uh, Cape Polaris, not the Royal Polaris, but the old Cape Polaris, ninety uh, five footer, and these things are so big they come by so fast. You know, these are sixty sixty five mile an hour fish. Uh, fish. I mean, they're I call them cars, but that's okay. Wow. But they, they get line shy. <clears throat> and these guys wouldn't bite anything heavier than 60-pound test. Ooh. And uh, I got spooled twice on 60-pound. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mort had one hooked up for two hours fi- in five minutes, two hours, and, and, and wouldn't hand it off because we're thinking this, this guy's uh, most likely – over 400 pounds, world record class, and and we and he was an old man, and uh, he fought it and fought it and fought it and fought it and got it up where we could get a gaff on it. The uh, deckhand went down, and there there's a method you go over the fish, down, and swing, pull it right back to your armpit. Yeah. He poked the fish on the way down. The fish flipped, sounded, snapped the hook, and we lynched the yeah. deckhand. Man, game over. So yeah, He's you gone. know. And, and, and when you're getting spooled with uh, anything over 40 pounds, say 60, 80 pounds, it sounds like a 30 out six when, when it hits the end. Oh, I bet. Pow! Ugh. All righty. Hey, we'll come back, and uh, we're going to be talking to Vern Bagley on a couple of VA uh, situations uh, uh, next segment, and we have one soldier for August 17th to honor and roll call. I'm Don McDowell. We'll be right back. For a symbol for what they've done. All righty, we're back. We're uh, hitting and missing on uh, uh, former Lieutenant uh, Vern Bagley, so we'll just uh, go on about our business. Um, yeah, you know, back to back to that tuna fishing. Uh, you know what? Last time, and, and you asked about that, and thank you. I spooled up a thirty and forty pound test mm-hmm. based on the fishing report, right? And didn't get bit. Didn't get bit. Didn't get bit. Didn't get bit on bait, and, and I hate throwing live bait to begin with. So I switched to uh, the new bait, and I need to give you one of those because I think it's going to be a real striper killer. Uh, it's a mega bait. I, I've been using them. You have you? One ounce. Nice. Yeah. yeah okay. about, the one I use is about four inches long. Yeah. And it's easy to bend. You know, I put a little bend in it. Yeah, buddy. Uh, it's blue back and chrome. You know. There you go. 
Good yep, stuff. That's it. Well, I started started catching them on those, and uh, <clears throat> I had uh, let's see, I had uh, I bought six, I had ten, I brought four home. Yeah. Bam. And they're pricey. Oh yeah, they're yeah at, at the landing. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> I mean, you obviously have more than enough gear. I've seen your your gear room. You have more than enough gear. Would it behoove you to take one ride with 80-pound test and say, come on? I do. You just didn't happen to hit that one, right? Uh, no, I used the 80 on the uh, on the troll. Okay. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. What I did, I didn't have, because, uh, you know, I had I had my stuff. I had to furnish rods for uh, Donnie and Patrick. Right. So everybody had three rods. Oh, okay. uh, plus the trolling rod, and I took a couple extra reels that were spooled with 20, and uh, didn't, you know, the, the fish, these yellowfin were running from like 15 to 45 pounds, and That's I don't want to, I don't want a 45 pound fish on a 20 pound line, no. I, I don't want to do that, uh, so I, w- I went back to the uh, 30 and 40 pound test on uh, using my swim baits, and uh, most everybody, and it, it, you know, it's kind of a, there's a courtesy element, I'm going to say, on the back of the boat. Okay. And it, it's, so uh, we had 31 guys on an 80 footer, and there's plenty of room. It was 25 foot across the back of the fantail, uh, you know, which will have 25 guys out of the 31 up there. And, uh, uh, most all of them are using bait, and then, you know, there I am right in the middle of them chucking. Yeah. And Lures winding, out. and, uh, these guys don't, you know, they did pretty well. I'd say probably 60% of them were following their line. The other ones were looking around, watching the birds and the lines under the boat, and they get bit, and they'll pop off six guys mm-hmm. just because that tuna's pissed off and yeah. on, on the wrong side. So um, I resorted back down to a uh, uh, 25-pound fluorocarbon leader. Because I wasn't smart enough to take 20 pound, like I knew I should have, and it was just one of those things that got overlooked. I had a spool of 25 pound fluorocarbon, threw it in the in the tackle bag, and uh, that's the way it went. And, and then the next trip, uh, you know, the water changes a little bit, uh, overcast conditions um, help on on line size. Mm-hmm. So you know, the next trip is going to be different. So. My my point is 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 take the twenty, thirty, and forty. Uh, if you don't want to take the twenty pound, at least take the uh, uh, fluorocarbon leader. Yeah. And use it. Yeah. And use it. So, how about you? Are you throwing uh, any type of leader? No. Nope. No, I'm not. I just throwing braid. No. No. I, I'm what? I'm, yeah. Believe it or not, yeah. I like to just use some uh, some uh, big game uh, ten pound. You know, I, I don't I don't need to throw anything. Horse man. You, I, you know, I don't ratchet him in or anything. I mean, a striper, I mean, when a big one takes off, when he sees the white bottom of that boat, he's going to take off. But if your drag set accordingly, you'll be all right. Get your paint roller out and paint the bottom of the boat black. I need to. Yeah, I'm serious. You're, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because when you have a 500-watt light system underneath it, uh, it's... That 500-watt does light Glowing. Up. Yeah. 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 That's a shout out to my friend John at Underwater Fish Light. He makes the best product I've ever used in my life. Really? Yeah, he's he's in Florida and it's a portable dock light. It's got transformers, uh, a metal halide bulb, a big HID bulb, uh, ceramic one piece uh, cage, and all that stuff for it. Uh, it is bright. And it runs off a of power inverter. I want to have to give volt. me one of those because you know Patrick's pretty good sport, but when you give him that uh, flashlight right. and tie a oh. rope on him, we go here. Yeah, here, hold this in your mouth. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 overkill, and I like it. Um, I like to level the playing field sometimes fishing. You know, you gotta you gotta make it easy sometimes. <laughs> easy. How much cut bait are you throwing? You know, I chum with about mm, a half a pound an hour and. And when we smoke through those anchovies, you know, and uh, what I've learned is, you know, tomato or mustard sauce, neither. Ugh, (laughs) you know, that's nasty. Yeah, yeah. Well, nothing like smelling like an anchovy. Oh man. Hey, I like them. Yeah. Mustard sauce is my preferred when I'm consuming them, but not when I'm fishing with them. Yeah. 
and I prefer them most on pizza. What kind of what kind of uh, bait hooks are you using on your cut bait? You know, I like to use the smallest ones I can find. A lot of people do the opposite of that, but these striper, it's not that they're mouse small, it's just that, just out of curiosity, like when, when the moon phase is high and, and the plankton's less dependent on my light, they're gonna be real finicky. Like you can see them, you know, look at your bait, but, uh, what I'll do when they get like that is I'll get the lightest hook, you know, the lightest line, lightest, smallest hook, and I'll free line it, and that's how I'm able to catch them, the ones that are tentative. Yeah. But I'll use like a, a trout hook almost. Just yeah. the smallest thing you can imagine. And I noticed also you don't use any kind of a, a leader off of their main line. You hook no. right to the main line. Yeah. And, and, and it's another, either hit or miss. You're, you're there, they're gone. And another focus point is it has to be clear, you know, because braided line under that light system that John Looks built, like a rope. Looks yeah. like a totem pole. <laughs> yeah. So Here, climb this. got to have clear. Man. It worked. I mean, you, know, you can yeah. see them. You can watch the fish. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. J.K., when you were out with um, Derek, what did you learn? Um, I learned that basically you need really good optics or, or good eyes, I swear, because we were watching all afternoon just trying to make sure we saw the shad jumping. And it's it's almost like a glistening effect. And when they start to hop, you know there's something different. And that's, I mean, we're chasing them. And they are lickety split fast. They are fast, yeah. It's amazing because you'll see them, and all of a sudden you see nothing. And everybody's going, scan, scan, scan. Oh, there they are. No, scan, scan, scan. There they are. They're gone yep. again. And they turn around, they pass right underneath you, and you don't know it. Yep. Boom. It's fun. They're fast. It's like chasing you would be a natural on the tuna boat in the crow's nest with your optics. Oh, would I have a ball with that? <laughs> Probably easy to spot a Volkswagen. Yeah, over a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but su- not at two miles. No, yeah, you'd be surprised at being, uh, you know, forty-five feet in the air doing this. <laughs> oh yeah. Or. Or pitching y'all. I'd probably be looking down. If I was oh, looking down I'd much. probably be bailing. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't last long in a cruise. It, it's okay if you're not using binoculars, but you get up there and magnify what you're, uh-huh. what oh. you're seeing. Yeah. <laughs> Vertigo. Yeah. No, choke and puke. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, we're going to get the uh, roll call for August 17th. Um, a lot of stuff's gone on over there, guys. Obviously, if you're paying any attention to the news whatsoever, President is playing golf while the uh, war was on fire. And uh, this past week, Army Sergeant First Class Samuel C. Hairston died on the uh, 12th of August, 2014, serving during Operation Enduring Freedom. 35 years old out of Houston, Texas, was assigned to the 1st Battalion, uh, the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. There's some bad boys right there. Uh, 1st Brigade Combat Team, 82nd Airborne out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Died on the 12th in Ghazni, Afghanistan of injuries caused by, once again, small arms fire. Certainly our uh, thoughts and and prayers go out to he, his family, and the uh, rest of the soldiers uh, in the unit he was assigned to. That's a small... uh, idea of what's happening over there there's uh, thousands of people dying over in, in uh, iraq this week and uh, we're sending more uh, advisors more airstrikes and uh, sneaking in the back door again uh, you need to think about that uh, one ticket punch for your uh, freedom last week i'm don mcdowell we'll be right back take away my fear Saltwater fisherman, the man that fears no fish, bass daddy and tournament pro, Don McDowell. Yep, that's right. Hey, uh, welcome to the second hour of Shake, Rattle, and Troll. Uh, Derek Franks is here uh, with us talking about striper fishing. J.K.'s uh, actually uh, got, got a little more update on the uh, Arizona Republic. But uh, in talking with uh, Captain Bill on the Malahini, he's been reduced to the couch in NASCAR today, which is not a bad thing. Uh, here, here's some of the boats um, that you want to pay attention to. If you go, you know, two day boat, the first string, 105 foot vessel, nice, nice boat, uh, 27 angler, 77 yellow fin tuna, eight dorados, 125 yellow tail. Uh, the old glory had uh, that was a one day trip, 36 anglers, 41 yellow tail, five yellow fin, five dorado, 
could have been better. Uh, the producer, another another good old line boat. That boat's been over there forever. Uh, 24 guys, uh, they had an even 50 uh, yellow yellow fin tuna. Sea Adventure 80, uh, there's no report on a couple of these guys. Uh, the Alicia, uh, a very small limited boat. I think they take uh, 13, 14 guys out. They had uh, 65 yellowtail. One of my favorite old boats, uh, the Blue Horizon, out on a one day. 14 anglers, 28 yellow fin, 22 yellowtail. And I think probably uh, I'll cut this off right here at the um, the Chief. Uh, two days uh, on a two and a half day trip. They had 31 anglers, 152 yellowfin, 12 dorado, 118 yellowtail. What disturbs me about that and the jig strike uh, that was on a one day, the skipjack is starting to show up. So that uh, end of the season. Yeah, that kind of is an indicator that uh, I don't know how much longer this is going to last. I, I'm i hoping it'll go into the bottom of September, maybe uh, 1st of October. I don't think the Yellowtail are going to bail this, this this year as warm as the water is. We'll have the home guards uh, hanging around the island and in the uh, depth of the uh, La Jolla Trench. Uh, right, Because as you go out, uh, hit about buoy number five and turn, Right, which is going up the U.S. coast. There's uh, right at Point Loma. It's called uh, Green Tank because there's a couple of green water tanks up on the hill, and it's, it's kind of a landmark. So uh, the yellowtail fishing net right out of there is uh, usually fairly decent. Uh, periodically, we get schools of barracuda like, like your schools of stripers, and it's just stupid, mm-hmm. just stupid. You know, you throw, I, I mean, every, every, every single cast. You know. Yeah, it almost makes you frustrated because you know that you can't do your actions fast enough to get your lure back out there. When I know, you're busting yeah, like that. yeah. You just, it, you know, the the greed sets in, and you want, yeah. you know, want to load, load the boat with them. So no doubt. Um, J.K., uh, what was your uh, assessment? Uh, you know, I want to divert a little bit and, and, and go back to the wolf thing. We had uh, last Monday the. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in their presentation of their uh, draft EIS, which covers the bulk of the state, and we've covered that, and I won't go back into it. Uh, you can check out uh, the whole scenario, both uh, their uh, plans, one, two, three, and 4, the cooperating agencies, of which there are 28 for Arizona that worked in conjunction with uh, Terry Johnson that you heard last week from ESA, uh, comma LLC, uh, Jim DeVos, uh, doing a good job up there for us. Uh, the mood of the whole meeting was kind of odd. Well, <laughs> you know, what, what was devoid is, you know, there was the pro woofers there that, uh, in, in my observation on them, not that I'm picking on them, but they, they fit a profile. Absolutely. I fit a profile. You yeah, fit a profile. I do too. These guys are, are extremely pale, extremely thin, look malnourished. Don't use makeup. Don't comb their hair. Look like they shop at the Goodwill. And, and they have uh, Birkenstock. <clears throat> yeah, one of them was driving some kind of an import called a virus. I'm, I'm not sure what that was, but well, singing Kumbayas, we're leaving. Oh, yeah, and have all your name tags. badges with oh, yeah. Wolf Prince. Like yeah. God dang third graders. <laughs> they, uh, I find that I think that they are the people that are the most insecure. And I certainly know that given an opportunity to go out into the woods alone, they would be petrified. Um, they're not ones who would be able to do well with it. You know, we enjoy it out there. We're part and parcel of it. They do it on a clinical aspect. And quite frankly, I think they were the guys who got the Explain that. What, what do you mean a clinical aspect? They, they sit behind a desk okay. and a monitor. I got it. And yeah. And basically, what they are is I call them the keystone, you know, the keyboard killers. Yeah. You know, they're hunting us. This is not about wolves anymore. This is about wanting us off the landscape totally. And the only way they can effectively do it is through what their their perceived power, which is through all the environmentalists that they have now in Fish and Wildlife Services and, and other agencies. And they're trying to get us off the land through legislative efforts. And part of this is the Endangered Species Act. The more animals that you can list in arizona has 25 listed species under the uh endangered species act now we have the most in the nation can you name those do i want to no can i no yeah okay i know enough of them i know the spotted owl i know the the mexican gray wolf the narrow nose garter snake the mexican garter snake yeah 
let's go back to the spotted owl. You know mm-hmm. that that is another failed um, model. You know they did that up in the uh, Oregon and um, Washington uh, woods, let's say. And at the end of the day, uh, 20 years into this, the logging industry is uh, kaput. Communities are ghost towns. And the spotted owl, because of the increased forest density, it continues to die. These things have have a six-foot wingspan. They can't get through no, the woods. No. And I, that's part of it. You, you take a look at all of the – they've listed 15 over 1,500 animals under the Endangered Species Act since 1983 – or 73, excuse me, when it came in. Two percent have recovered. Just two. That's 33 species out of 1,500. It's a losing proposition. Most of this is going to go the way it's going to go. Well, and there's not a damn thing we're going to be able to do about it. No, but the, we've spent trillions of dollars providing these people money to do what they do, which is to lobby, to effort, I mean, to make efforts, what they have legislatively. And just like last, I mean, Monday night was a fiasco. You had two polar opposites looking at each other like you just wanted to kill them. Well, what was devoid up there was the sea of camouflage hats. This time, no, you had a lot of cowboy hats, but you didn't. There was an awful lot of cowboy hats, but what I'm getting at is, it didn't seem like the uh, the hunting community engaged to the extent they have in the past. And and uh, the other thing I want to point out, and I think the article in the paper in your panel of five there is pretty indicative of the the wind shifting, the mood across the country. We're seeing exposés coming out on. from the Department of Justice, uh, a report from uh, June of 2012 on the, on the amount of money that has been paid to them under the EAJA Act. We're seeing exposés coming out uh, that ye- haven't yet been uh, solidified on the TRCP, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservancy Partnership, being a green decoy, and 77 to 80% of their funding coming from green leftist uh, environmental groups. Uh, these guys talk, you know, finally they're starting to make sense here. Well, it's like anything else. When the whole population as a whole, those who are not tied one way or the another, when the regular population starts to see the effects of these things, then they start. This is 25 years ago that they destroyed the timber industry, and now people are calling for a timber industry to start taking care of these woods. They claim, and all of them, are opposing the environmentalists and what they have done over the past 25 years. Well, it's too late for a lot of those jobs. Now, maybe there's new industry out there, but I've always felt if you utilize a resource and don't destroy it, that's what you have. One of our one of our favorite green commissioners, Jennifer Martin, always claimed that utility fosters use. If you have the opportunity to get out there, and that's where it should be, use the land, don't abuse the land. Exactly. But now they've gone all the way to the far end of the spectrum and said, do not, I don't want to see anybody out there. Well, on the shakerattleandtroll.com website, uh, we're going to be uh, posting uh, Tom Remington, and it's tremington at gmail.com. You can sign up for his uh, weekly editorials, and uh, this past week he's talking about a pizzly, pizzly bear, which is a cross between a grizzly and a polar bear, and he gets into the wolf hybrids with Koi was uh, interbreeding with the coyotes and them interbreeding and with the dogs, and all of a sudden we've got wolf well, soup. So, anyway, having said that, uh, we're going to thank uh, some of our sponsors, including Bill Luke Chrysler, Jeep and Dodge, yep, I-17 in West Camelback Road since 1927, and they sell tires and wheels. It's, Can uh, you imagine 20-inch uh, rims, eight <laughs> lugs on your Prius? <laughs> Knife! <laughs> I'm here with John Colazar and Derek Frank. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening. Since Steamboat Springs, Nailing Hay outside. Wow, that's right, JK. You could have had a V8. Yeah, well, I did in my old 383. Love okay. it. Right. That's all good. Hey, uh,. Before I forget, let me give you a new uh, contact phone number for the Pleasant Harbor Marina. It's 928-501-5269. 928-501-5269 for the Pleasant Harbor Marina. Uh, we'll get that ad changed up uh, next week. 
All right, we're changing gears, going back to downtown San Diego at H&M Landing with Rick in the tackle shop where the weather is always nice and the fish are always biting. What's happening, Rick? Well, the weather's nice and the fish are biting. <laughs> well, okay. Thanks for joining us. We'll no see you next problem. week. Gee, that helps. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just what, just what can I say? Yeah, they're, they're biting everywhere. It's, there's yellows on the half-day boat. There's big bonita at the islands and some on the half-day. And, of course, everybody's wanting about the, know about the tuna, and the tuna are just going off. It's limit-style fishing almost every day on the full-day boats. Well, I was talking to uh, Captain Bill on the Malahini yesterday, and they said they got into some 100, 150-pound uh, bluefin that were just popping lines right and left. Oh, yeah, those fish, you got to be prepared for them. I just talked to a guy, he got a 115-pounder, took him three hours. Wow. Ooh, I what, need a nap. How, course, how heavy got, a line? You got it on 40 pounds. Cool. That's and good. Fish kicked his butt, and he had to hand it off to the captain to finally kill it. Those things get tough. Those last fifty, sixty feet, Ooh, they don't want to yeah. go back up. And uh, you know, I've seen four or five hundred pounders this morning already. There's some big monster fish out there. Wow! Thank God for two speed reels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, boy. Um, I'm seeing a few uh, skipjack. Anything to worry about there? Yeah, there's nothing to worry about. That just means you can bring more yellowfin. You know, there's the skipjack normally come around the end of the season with the dolphin because they like that real warm water. But uh, I've seen, seen them caught with the albacore, too, so you never know. The, the skippies are just pretty voracious. But they are generally, you know, traditionally we always thought that that was saying that it was going to be near the end of the year when you start seeing a lot of skippies. But we're not seeing a lot of skippies. So hmm. there's still tons of yellowfin out there, still a lot of bluefin out there. It, you know, you got to catch a bluefin in California waters. We haven't gotten the official documents back from Mexico yet to make it okay, even though verbally they said it's okay to catch them. Um, but uh, until we get the written written rules, we don't want to go down there and play with that too much. But, you know, those, there's plenty of bluefin up north, and they're catching a ton of them. Well, that's good stuff. Uh, what are you recommending the guys are bringing? Uh, cause I, I, you know, when I came over, I had 30, 40, should have had uh, some 20 spooled up. Uh. Well, you can certainly do that with the yellowfin, but if there's bluefin in the mix of that school, too, you throw out with the 20, you're just going to frustrate yourself. Bam. I wouldn't do anything those 30, 30 and 40, and I'd bring a 60-pound outfit if you have one. Yeah, boy. You know, because if those big boys show up, that's what you want to have in there instead of a killing yourself on a 30 or 40 pound outfit yeah man okay i agree you know, I've, I've caught i've caught tuna of over 100 pounds on 30 pound before and it's you're on it for a couple hours at least and then generally you lose them right at the end because you're worn out and so is the tackle oh yeah so, oh yeah so have your gear ready well for too and then for. you know even on this yellow yellow fin that we were catching uh you know if they took the bait in a little bit too deep uh they do have uh you know, not significant uh, amount of big teeth, but you don't want to try to thumb one. You know, they'll no. uh, they'll pop the line. So oh, yeah, definitely. That the fluorocarbon really makes a difference on that, and ringed hooks too. If you use ringed hooks, especially ringed circle hooks on the bluefin and uh, yellowfin, you hook more of them in the corner of the mouth so that they can't get that line in their mouth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I had, uh, in fact, one of those mega baits that uh, you handed off to me. I never saw it again. The fish swallowed it. <laughs> they like those things sometimes. I, I'm telling you, and, and that's the first time. You know, most of the time, you know, you hook them, you know, in in the mouth, in the jaw, maybe yep. a little bit deep. But I, I've never had one that that thing was gone. It so, sounds, like, it sounds like a wahoo eating it. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good. All right, cool. Well, we'll give the phone number out, and uh, uh, again, we've been giving out the six one nine two 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 one one four four number to book their trips. Uh, Very good. They can also book online at hmlanding.com. dot com. Well it's said. Getting tougher and tougher to find them, so find a trip. So book early and plan ahead. All right, cool beans, man. You have a, Thanks, a good rest of the day. Uh, Rick at the tackle shop at H and M Landing. <laughs> Enough said. Good yeah. report. Book your trip. Book your trip. All right. Any, anything you want to add on? Uh, we got a couple minutes before we talk to uh, Mr. Guggenhauer. In fact, we're not talking to Guggenhauer no, today. No, we're not. No, we're not. I'm. I'm going to have to go do his report. He's up at the Duncan B. Lodge in uh, Canada somewhere, having a good time. Pike and musky. That sounds like fun. Northern uh, pike are a blast. I would imagine. I bet they find. Yeah. Oh, they do. Actually, I found that. Uh, 
Muskie, you really want to get into. Pike, they're fun. There's no doubt about that, but you can tire them out. We used to use the red and white Daredevil spoons, and mm-hmm. they just knock them silly. Nice. That's old school. Thank you. you got to be old school. You'll always be in style. Well, what, what are you recommending uh, for your guys to bring on board? Well, um, for starters, you want to bring a headlamp, and if you have a favorite 6-foot, 7-foot rod with 10-pound clear monofilament line uh, rigged with a – well, I'll actually rig the drop shot rig for you. You know, there's a lot of controversy on what rig is best for night fishing, you know, when you're vertical fishing, but I like to have a tight line between myself and the hook. So I'm going to use a drop shot rig uh, with a bait casting reel. So uh, those striper are going to pick a bait up as it's dropping. So – my preference is a bait casting reel so you can feel that subtle hit. And that that's the one other thing I did notice that night and that is is that the hits are very subtle. Yeah. Just a slight tap. And if you don't pull at the right time, just more anchovies. Yep. I mean they and they do that. No doubt. Well, we're finding also, too, is is that as the season progresses, you're seeing a different patterning, obviously, that's going to go on. How long do you think you're going to fish into the year? Uh, I think this pattern will last until, uh, you know, until it, you know, our our first cool spell. I mean, right now that the shad first of November. Yeah, I mean the 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 shad fry have always been out, you know, roaming around and getting picked off by little little striper. But now with the plankton starting to come up with the cooler night temps, the big shad uh, have broken out of the trees in the river arms and the creek arms, and they're starting to come up. Uh, so, you know, you're catching bigger striper that are not structurally oriented. They're just chasing bait. Uh, pretty easy to, to pick off. This is when you're going to catch your trophy striper off a of topwater bait for all those bass fishermen that are wanting to, to cross the fence for a little bit. This is the time to do that. Um, and then it's going to go back to, to trolling with live bait in the fall. How much time do you spend fishing the pumps? You know, I don't really go over there that much anymore. Why? I don't know. Um, I guess because it's too close to where I put in. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, you know, I I have fished there, but it's, um, I don't know. I, I've been spending a lot of time in Scorpion Bay, you know, just trying to get to know new parts. Uh, I fished the pumps all last you. year. I don't blame you. You know, they've got a restaurant and a bar. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, you know, my, my sales pitch is if the weather comes up, we can go straight to Dylan's bar. So it's yeah, easy I'm starting to smell sell. a pattern here. Yeah, yeah, I am too. <laughs> <And I'll>, easy <laughs> well, alcohol or power, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm bugged. <laughs> Scorpion Bay. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. You got to know your exit strategy, and that involves uh, Dylan's Bar sometimes. So, actually, that's a nice the way they have that set up. I enjoyed that. That's that's a big ass, big big butt air barge. Yeah, and there is a myth there, and it's true. The striper will eat French fries that are underneath that place. Do they really? Yeah. Yeah, they, they'll pass up a natural bait for a French fry. Nice. Which is interesting, yeah. And they're they're so line shy. If you start telling me to troll artificial fry, <laughs> <laughs> we need some French golden power brown bait. with a red dot, <laughs> yeah, and a little streak of blue along the edge. Yeah, we yeah. need a, a French fry mold here, please. Yeah, <laughs> that's bizarre. <laughs> well, I've always found that throwing that ounce and a half cast master, uh, usually with a uh, a dressed hook, th- uh, right right at the buoys, and uh, depending on what rod and reel you're using you can hit the uh, concrete uh columns out there at the pump station and uh, let it go down for about i'd give it at least uh, a 90 second countdown mm-hmm. and then just rip that sucker back the boat fast you can yeah rip yep. it. it's a great technique and there's a lot of big large mouth hanging around there too at uh, certain times of the year but uh yeah Will they hit? Will a large mouth hit if you're reefing it that fast as you do for striper? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. They react on one right yeah. now. They they can't help it. No. You know it's like a mouse running in front of a cat. He may not be hungry, but he's going to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Slap so, it silly. Yeah, really good stuff. How many uh, uh, trips are you looking at uh, between now and the end of the year? Man, you know I've been I've been really pumping it out there on weekdays. Uh, the the monsoons have been knocking a lot of the the trips off you know because it's so dangerous to be out there but if i get a weather alert we're going to reschedule before i hit the water but um yeah the water is one thing but when that static electricity starts popping around you're out yeah. there with a six or seven foot fishing rod they call it a lightning rod yeah for a reason. not good well all righty uh we're gonna uh 
listen to some some more of our sponsors. Uh, J.K., when we come back, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Guggenhauer's report. Uh, Good. He's having fun. We're yeah, working. he's up there. Something about a party girl lured Jensen's spoon that he found. Um, party girl kind of scares me, but yeah. How do you put that in the same sentence? <laughs> yeah. You know what? Guggenhauer will figure it out. Anyway, uh, I'm he- I'm here with uh, Candace Lupus <laughs> and Striper Snatcher One P. Copy that. <laughs> we'll be back. Well, the morning's kind of damp. I'm not worried about cutting the grass. Left my truck at the boat ramp and my boat is full of gas. All righty, that means uh, Rim Country Custom uh, Rods Fishing Report for uh, August 16th. James is at large, so... He's having fun. He's taking a vacation. Yeah, something about a party girl lure. I, 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 yeah. No, I don't he, know what that's code for. I, I don't know. There'll be a Nor does Mrs. Letter. Guggenheim. <laughs> but he, he repla- uh, reports that uh, our, our pace in uh, bass fish, fishing pro, Clifford Perch, uh, finished in 20th place at the Bassmaster Elite Series on the Delaware River last week. Uh, that's... Uh, Pretty good field and a pretty tough place to uh, fish. The uh, lake level at Roosevelt Lake remains constant this past week at 39 percent due to the monsoons. The uh, it's salt river start rising soon. No, nah, it just ain't constant. The uh, salt side was flowing uh, 700 cubic feet per second, which is 150 percent of its uh, normal rate uh, for this time of year. And uh, Tunnel Creek is slightly, slightly flowing. That means just a little bit. A little trouble. Yeah. But anyway, the bass fishing was called good uh, the past week. Uh, some of the uh, anglers had reported reaction bites, uh, small size uh, crankbaits fish slowly. Um, reaction innovation, paddle tail swim bait, uh, you know, was a highlight last week. Uh, that's good stuff uh, for fishing on, uh, you know, shallow water for bass that are fitting on shad. Another bait reported successful was the lipless crankbait, i.e. the rattle trap. <laughs> rattle trap. Yep, yep. Fished in uh, 20, 20 to 30 feet of water off of uh, main points and drop off. So, you know, th- that's a good bet. Uh, Clipper Perch, uh, outdoor, uh, his jigs uh, in a brown with black fleck seems to be working uh pretty well uh drop shot using a uh, robo in a camel color with a purple four inch color worm Ooh, nice. you can't go wrong with the purple you know you you just can't um no. yeah there's there you know we could do three days on the color purple that was uh, the only color my grandfather would condone it had to be purple or uh, motor oil you know that was back no, when yeah. they had that motor oil color and we we still it have it hot I mean, it was the hottest thing earth tones. back in the 80s. You know? Yeah, you know, sticking with your earth tones, but uh, again, when you start switching to crankbaits, uh, I'm more than an advocate of the color purple. It, yeah. Just a little bit. Because if you, if you start looking at the... I'm going to get on this soapbox again. I don't mean to. <laughs> but if you start looking at your forage fish, there's one common denominator, and I don't give a damn what species of forage fish it is, there is a flash of purple yeah, on that fish. A little rainbow. There is. So, anyway, uh, crappie, the crappie bite was fair, uh, which was down a little bit uh, from the prior week, which, you know, they had a full moon at that time. And uh, at nighttime, crappie fishing uh, usually requires a live minnow in, in good shape and so on and so forth. Trot fishing on all the uh, upper rim lakes was uh, good to excellent, e- even though we had a little bit of water, you know, which is a good thing. And uh, most of those were uh, uh, power baits, grubs, and dry flies. Now, our our guy Doug was up in northern northern Utah fly fishing. He's uh, has embarked on uh, a new career. Yeah, he's teaching himself how to fly fish, and uh, that's good. Uh, we talked. I suggested uh, going down to the local bait store or convenience <coughs> store, getting a can of uh, night crawlers. Pinching oh, off about a half, about a half inch of worm, hooking it on your black gnat or whatever it is you're using, and woolly burger. Yeah, fling it out there. I don't know, fling is the proper term, but 
You know, yeah. you would be, you would, en- you and I both. I mean, I've done enough fly fishing to know that I enjoy it. It's fun. Yeah. Um, you get yourself into a, a float tube and get out into the deep part of the lake, like Christmas Tree Lake up on the res, and it is unbelievably peaceful. Yeah. I kind of get a kick out of, uh, you know, de-stressing and, and running up to uh, where the tubers put in on the Salt River mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, a pair of cutoffs and some sneakers and just wading out there, cooling off and uh, catching some trout and... Uh, the, the story that I shared with Doug was, you know, I wasn't real proficient with the fly rod at that time. And I'm, I, I'm out there late in the afternoon, and, and it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Havelina and, uh, and uh, a coyote here and there. And I'm watching this guy, and, and about every third cast, he's putting a, a trout in his creel. And I'm not catching anything, you know, because I'm a little bit too hard, and I'm popping popping my flies and i went down and i bought from orvis i bought hand-tied african flies mm-hmm. paid way too much money for them and if you do, do it a little bit too hard to go and you're tying on another one and this guy's coming in i go man you're d- excellent day for you he goes oh yeah you know bites real good i said well if you don't mind sharing what were you using he goes worms <laughs> what he put worms keep it on- simple yeah, ride. well, what he was doing, he had a, a can of worms from Circle K down on uh, uh, mm-hmm. Power Road, and he was pinching off a piece of worm, putting it on his fly, put put it out there. and, and It I gives said, you a little bit extra weight, which makes your I fly said, cast yeah, yeah. easier. W- would you sell me what you have left? He said, no. Uh, what? No, I'm coming back tomorrow. Oh. Oh, going, damn take it. your worms. Uh, yeah, let me, let me buy one worm. He goes, no. What? So I had enough time. I jumped in the truck, ran down to the uh, Circle K, bought a can of worms, came back, and you know I took my my fair share of uh, dinner home that evening, and uh, never forget it. And uh, a couple of days later, same thing. I go, man, what were you using? I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Pro status so, worms. Yeah, it's all good. Elite series worms. Well, yeah. let, let, let's finish up on the. Um, uh, the rattle traps. Uh, you're going to that. James's fishing report for largemouth on uh, Roosevelt uh, definitely uh, kind of emphasizes what we're talking about. Go to the lipless uh, crankbaits, uh, i.e., the rattle trap by name, by brand, by rattle trap. Period. By USA. Yeah, the the clones. Uh, there, there's a lot of clones out there now. Have you had any success with the ones with the fins on the back? No, never tried them. Haven't tried them. No. You will. Uh, okay. I mean, and, all I gotta do is grab a classic one, and I never. Okay, so you're not into ch- you know changing out the hooks and. No, I go right out the box, mainly because I don't have time to play with them uh, as much as I'd like. Okay. Because I'm too busy repairing rods and backlash reels from the previous trip. Um, but yeah, I mean, I. What I like about them is right out of the box they they run true. Most crankbaits do not yeah, run. Yeah, baby. You know, true. You got, yeah. And uh, you know the cool thing is about a rattle trap is a striper can hit it like a freight train and it'll still run uh, true. I mean you you had to adjust it every now and then, but there's not uh, a lot to adjust. No. But I do like to change out the back hook, put the Daiichi uh, Trouble uh, bleeding hook on there. Uh, we've got Burn Bagley uh, on the line, and uh, I understand that. Uh, we had given the uh, wrong phone number out for Vern, so we're going to switch over to Vern for a few minutes. Vern, how are you doing? Good morning. I'm good morning to you, and I'm doing very fine. Thank you. Good for you, LT. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry we missed you on the first segment, uh, but we've changed that up, that little technological glitch. So, <laughs> okay. what, what do you have for us? I know you're tracking uh, VA pretty hard, and uh, we're trying to do something for the veteran community. Uh, what do you have to update this week? Well. The, the, this whole segment is about the backstory, and the backstory being whatever it is that we are not reading or hearing, there is more to a story, and sometimes we add that more to a story, and it changes, changes entirely what it what we thought the headline. The announcer's little soundbite or a politician's soundbite is all about, and and so we're going to be devoting talking about the backstory. 
what really is happening. Okay, and we may bump into a break, so we'll uh, we'll when we do, we'll pick you right up after the break for about five minutes. No, no problem. Just tell me to shut up, and I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, keep going. We got about a minute before we got to snap. Okay. Well, we have two issues that really are so totally different, and yet have such a similar backstory. And one of them is occurring over in Iraq right now with the ISIL group, the uh, ones that are going through cutting off heads and saying you're either going to become a Muslim or you're going to die. And then we have the border story, our border, the Mexican border. And the back stories, even though they're different, you're going to find out there's a lot of similarity. All right, that's a good uh, stop it off point. Uh, stay with us more with uh, Vern Bagley, Military Families Foundation Project We Remember. We'll be right back. All righty, Vern, uh, go right ahead, sir. Okay, well, uh, using your uh, the sponsorship, we need to have True True Hook create a, a uh, some type of a device that can hook these uh, lies, bring them to the surface, and let everybody see them. And that's the backstory. And very quickly, uh, the backstory in um, Iraq and in Syria. Now remember that what we are reading today is about Iraq, and it's about the northern portion of Iraq. And, but yet this all started in Syria. And we have a president of the United States who has said what we would want to hear and that oh, we were caught off guard. We didn't know. We had no idea. And yet my contacts in the intelligence community and even those within the intelligence community who were coming out and, ver- and saying to the public, this is wrong. We've had this warning, and we have been warning about this issue for well over a year. And only now, with all of these people that were captured, uh, beheaded, uh, chased up to the top of a mountain, uh, are we starting to hear about it. And it's the same thing with the border. We, we've got a group of politicians that have artfully change the subject from uh, the border to these poor people. Well, the problem to all of us in the back story is that if we would not have a porous border, we wouldn't have this problem. But nobody wants to talk about it. Vern, at the end of the day, uh, we're putting military advisors, some, uh, the numbers fluctuating from 150 or 130 to 180 to 200. Uh, what's going to happen there? Uh, they're already withdrawing them. President Obama has declared a victory that the those who are on top of that mountain have on their own escaped without having intervention by U.S. and Kurdish troops, declared victory and started bringing, bringing home vast numbers of those who were sent. How's he going to feel when they blow the dam? Well, you know, he's going to probably say, oops, son of a gun. It's just one of those things where we had no idea they'd do such a dumb thing. But I just read this morning, again, toward the backside of the story, that our U.S. embassy in Iraq, if they were to blow that, would suffer a water surge of over 10 feet. Not that I want to be the devil's advocate, but that may not be a bad thing. <laughs> I, it's you know, a, it's that's a cleansing. I love, I love to talk that to you because you bring, you bring a perspective to, uh, and, and your audience, you bring your perspective to the things that I look at from my side, and they're accurate, they're true, but there are things that I don't think about, and I love it dearly. Well, the end of the, at the end of this uh, particular segment, Vern, uh, which is coming up here uh, real quick, uh, all of the lives that were lost to U.S. soldiers on the ground in Iraq uh, have have been for naught. 
we need to do this thing all over again. It's like Vietnam. We didn't finish the war. We pulled our, our uh, sustainable uh, troops out way too early. They should have left them there more more than a year. Develop the <clears throat> whatever democratic style of government they can do over there. And I, I don't know that they can ever do it. These guys have been fighting for 5,000 years before Christ. I don't think Obama's going to finish the job. Yeah. And, and I, I just hope in 2016 uh, the uh, populace, the dumbed-down portion of America, votes the correct way uh, across the board, not only in, in, in the country but in the states. Uh, we've got so darn many problems here, and I hate to see our troops get recommitted, <clears throat> which they need to, uh, to finish this thing up. And, you know, I think the same thing is happening in Afghanistan where we're doing a strategic withdrawal. And everything that we've fought and died for over there is going to be left at risk in the, uh, whether it's ISIS, Hamas, uh, Al Qaeda, or, you know, they're just terrorist group after terrorist group ready to fill the void when we withdraw. Yeah. So true. And, and they're anxious to see this happen. Uh, there's one saying that I've, I have worked with my life and I, I believe it. I'm a Vietnam veteran, as you know. And that simply is that in Vietnam, as well as in Iraq and Afghanistan, I personally believe we won the war, we won each of those wars, and we lost the peace. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good stopping off point. Uh, Vern, God love you. We'll uh, pick this up next week, and uh, I'll talk to you next week. Okay, take care, Don. Vernon Bagley, uh, CEO of the uh, Military Families Foundation Project. We remember uh, former Vietnam uh, uh, servicemen. And uh, back to you, J.K., anything you want to add before we get this thing wrapped up? No, at this point, Don, I know that uh, you know, the uninvolved population will ultimately determine the future of the Endangered Species Act. And, and quite frankly, it may be beyond our lifetime, I think, that we will see a a residual backlash from this uh, wanton amount of wolves that they want to place everywhere and try and get people off the landscape, there will be a, a rise. I mean, they were saying there's only been two people killed in the last hundred years. Wrong. They, what they fail to point out is is that in North America, in the past nine years, there's been two people killed. And that incidence will increase because of habituation. I think my numbers are higher than that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's or, world, world worldwide. No, I'm talking... Talking in the North American continent. Oh, we know there is, but yeah. they refuse we'll bring, to acknowledge uh, Next week, we're looking forward to having Tom Remick on here. I know uh, you've been chatting with him. I've been chatting with him. Uh, Tom uh, Remington's uh, email, if you want to sign up for that email, and I'd highly suggest it. He's got a very interesting uh, perspective and articles of what's going going on around the country. He and Jim Beers are, are fast friends, and you know Jim always puts in some articles that are very interesting. And the, between the two of them, they have their pulse on what is really repulsively wrong in this yeah, country. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, it's tremington at gmail, uh, dot com. Uh Be sure and sign that up. We'll have a link up on the uh, Shake, Rattle, and Troll website. We've got a lot of good inf- fishing information. We've got uh, the Wolf, uh, Wolf Wars page uh, is up which will give you a insight and a perspective, hopefully in, in, in a manner that it can be absorbed on what the service is doing, what they are doing, what we are doing in order to combat this. And uh, once again, my hat's off to the uh, Game and Fish Commissioners uh, for their uh, recent decision and ruling on uh, the cooperating agency's plan, having the, uh, f- the Forest Service adopt the main uh Population cap, the range, the management management protocol, either that or we withdraw and we litigate. I, I think that's the ultimately you know as well as I do that Sherry Barrett is getting directions from Dr. Tuggle, who's getting directions from Dan Ash, who's getting <clears throat> direction from, from President Obama, Jewel, and well, then Sally Obama. Jewel, yeah, yeah and she's yeah. she's taking care of that. But I I think we're going to have to we're going to see that it's going to take time. We're going to have to have the uninvolved public comment on it, and they'll become aware of it, just like if they do a grizzly bear reintroduction. You see how many people you want to have. Well, the question Creek. was asked. I, I, did you catch that? Yes. If if the uh, grizzly bear, and, and this question was posed to the Fish and Wildlife Service, 
are you intending to reintroduce grizzly bears? And they just laughed and said, oh, no, we would never do that. And they go, yeah, well, that's what you said about the wolves. Yep. So, a grizzly bear coming to a town near you, Green mm. Valley Park. No tool. ticket required. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, I, you know. Well, they find that people who are not accustomed to being in the woods will just have a wonderful time trying to sleep at night knowing that well, there's a grizzly you know, within I one mile. Well, you know, I think that's part and parcel. So. If you want to join the Sierra Club, uh, you, you all need to go on the- on it. <laughs> oh, there's one get in the, the room. The, I, I have unfortunately heard that up close and personal. I, I, there is nothing you, every time that I will, hear that, I get shivers going, yeah. damn, where's the bear spray? Uh-huh. Yeah, that is not one that you ever want to hear up yeah, close. Yeah, the only difference between your bear spray and, and my bear spray is mine, come, mine comes out of a uh, full <laughs> choke. <laughs> and mine comes out yeah, of a well. spray nozzle, and I pray that it's working that day. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're hiking up into a canyon, uh, Derek, not too long ago where, where we've been tracking a bear. I've seen the bear. We've seen evidence of a very big bear. And I'm, I'm thinking John's got a water bottle. It's black, got a little <laughs> ring on it. It's kind of cool. I go, what do you got there? He goes, spray paint. He goes, spray paint? <laughs> For what? He goes, I want to mark the spot where the bear got you. <laughs> Come on, paint. Turn a brown bear black. Oh, man. Yeah, well, that particular canyon we were goofing around in gets... Uh, it's pretty close. Oh yeah, it's yeah. a it's a narrow ca- it's a narrow canyon, and there that that bear has impressive deposits that he leaves on a regular basis. Oh, absolutely, and uh, I, I'd say I'd, I'd make him probably about a size eleven shoe. Wow. Well, I, I saw your shoe in the photos that I have, and you know, pretty much he fits a size eleven shoe. Yeah. Jeez. So, all right. Website, phone number, how did we get a hold of you to go striper fishing? You can get a hold of the striper snatcher at uh, 480-259-2931 or what? www. One more. One, one more. Yeah. You, you said it right. Ah. 480-259-2931 or stripersnatcher.com. Now striper that, snatcher's out of the building. Okay. So that phone number is good if you can find your phone. Yeah. P.S. Uh, my phone's in Cave Creek. If you see it, uh, you get a free fishing trip. There you go. Turn it in. All right. Hey, I'm Don McGall. Hope you learned something today. We had fun. JK, God love you. Thanks for coming down. And Derek, uh, as always, you're, you're just a pleasure. And uh, by the rattle trap, man. There's only one rattle trap. I'm Don right. McGall. Katie's Lupus. Derek Franks. Take your kids fishing. Hug your bass boat. Man, we're out of here.